Welcome, everybody. We'll get started here in another minute. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, welcome. That's uh, my beep, says that it's the top of the hour. And good afternoon, all. Welcome. My name is Alan Barr with COEH Northern California. And on behalf of the NIOSH supported education and research centers throughout the country, we're pleased to present the 2021 ERC ergonomics webinar series, where we offer free monthly webinars on various topics on human factors and ergonomics. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. And thank you for joining us today. All participants who logged in with their registration email will receive a link to the recording and an evaluation form that will qualify participants for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. A couple of uh, upcoming webinars you might be interested in on August 24th, you can join us for permeation through disposable nitrile gloves, gun cleaning solvents and gunshot residue in partnership with uh, Travis Cribbs, a doctoral student and the Southern California NIOSH ERC. Also on September 15th, uh, the next in our ERC ergonomics series, Preventing Slips, Trips, and Falls, hot topic for sure, current research and trends in partnership with Dr. Andrew Merriweather and the Rocky Mountain Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, University of Utah. You can register for that and other upcoming webinars at coeh.berkeley.edu forward slash webinars. For today's webinar, you will be muted during the presentation as usual. If you'd like to ask a question, and we encourage you to do so, please enter it into the online Q&A. We'll save some time at the end of the presentation to address those questions. Um, as I mentioned, today's webinar will be recorded, and it will be made available along with past webinars on the COEH Northern California YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe to help us to continue to grow that channel. Today's webinar, the title, Hazards in the Craft Brewing Industry, Understanding Injuries Through Workers' Compensation Data, presented by Dr. Colleen Brentz in partnership with Mountain and Plains Education and Research Center. Dr. Brentz, PhD, AEP, completed her studies at Colorado State University in the Department of Environmental and Radiological Health Ergonomic Sciences through the Mountain and Plains ERC. Her research focused on occupational injuries among craft brewery workers in Colorado. She works in international health and safety consulting, where she conducts ergonomics assess assessments, evaluates and develops ergonomics and safety programs, and helps global companies improve their health and safety. And with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Brentz. I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thank you, Ellen, for the introduction. Like you said, today I'll be presenting on my research on hazards in the craft brewing industry. And I recently finished my PhD at CSU or Colorado State University, which is funded by the Mountain and Plains Education Research Center, and that's affiliated with the Center for Work, Health, and Environment. And that explains all some of the um, icons at the bottom of that screen. So quick disclaimer, this research was um, this research and the ideas in this presentation do not represent the official views of the CDC and the Department of Health and Human Services. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my advisor, Dr. John Rosecrans. He was my academic advisor for both my master's and PhD studies at Colorado State University. And he was instrumental in acquiring resources and connections for this research 
as well as mentoring me in all things occupational ergonomics and safety. In this photo on the right, you can see he was with me on the floor in a kegging line as we worked with a craft brewery worker. So the purpose of this study was to characterize injuries specific to craft brewery workers and to identify contributing factors to injury. And the potential impact of this study is that the findings may be used to inform health and safety practitioners who are tasked with directing intervention resources to reduce injuries among craft brewery workers. So today I'll share a broad overview of my research on ergonomics and safety in craft breweries. I'll start with a brief overview of the craft brewing industry and why this research was needed. Then I'll touch on the methods I used and highlight some key results. And then finally, in implications, I will discuss how my findings apply to the craft brewing industry overall. Here are some learning objectives to keep in mind during this presentation. By the end, hopefully you'll be able to identify common injuries among craft brewery workers, describe limitations in reporting injuries in craft breweries, as well as recognize relationships between contributing factors for common injuries among craft brewery workers. So let's get started. What defines an American craft brewery? Well, the Brewers Association defines a craft brewery as an operation that is independent meaning it is predominantly owned and controlled by the brewers themselves. It has small production. By definition, a craft brewery cannot produce more than 6 million barrels of beer annually. In comparison, large breweries such as AB InBev, which includes Anheuser-Busch, they brewed more than 400 million barrels last year. Again, craft breweries produce 6 million. And then in reality, the majority of craft breweries actually produce less than 15,000 barrels every year. So there's a considerable range between even within craft breweries and then compared to large breweries. Finally, craft breweries produce beer, meaning they hold a brewer's notice and they brew beer using water, hops, grain, and yeast. Now the craft brewing industry has experienced rapid growth in the United States, including Colorado in the past decades. This graph here illustrates the recent growth in Colorado. We see time and years on the x-axis, and the dotted black line represents the number of operational craft breweries in Colorado, and the blue bars represent the number of brewing licenses. Craft breweries need a brewer's license to operate, so these blue bars represent both operational and potential craft breweries. And we can see the number of um, both operational and potential craft breweries has steadily grown since 2010. Today, Colorado has more than 420 craft breweries, and it's estimated that over 9,000 or 9,100 workers are employed at these facilities. So this rapid growth in the expansion of the craft brewing industry means that new facilities are opening and existing facilities are expanding. Here's a map of Colorado. Each red marker represents a craft brewery. You can see there's a concentration of craft breweries along the Front Range Mountains. And this is where Colorado State University in Fort Collins is located. So craft brewers were a very accessible study population. So we've established that the industry has grown, and now I'll share some examples of the work craft brewers do and what kind of hazards they can be exposed to. For starters, manual material handling. In this photo, we see a worker maneuvering a half barrel keg. Kegs are large pressurized vessels used to transport beer, and they can weigh 30 pounds when they're empty and over 160 pounds when they're full. Workers may also be in coolers and chilled warehouses. You'll notice the coat, hat, and gloves this man is wearing since he's in a cooler. Actually, is in a chilled warehouse. Uh, ke full kegs are often stored in cold areas to keep the product fresh. So in this photo, the worker is handling a full 160 pound keg. And then forklifts are often involved in these warehouses to stack pallets of kegs. Sometimes beer is aged in wooden barrels. For example, this barrel in the photo is in an old whiskey barrel. Even empty, there is residual whiskey soaked into the wood, which can add flavor to the beer and definitely adds weight to the overall load. Getting beer into and out of these wooden barrels is a physical challenge. Since beer is oxygen sensitive, you can't just dump out the beer unless you're throwing it out. So instead you have to use hoses and pipes, which can be accessed through a stopper or bunk on the rounded edge of this barrel. So in this photo, workers are rotating the barrel to access this bunk. Barrels, especially full ones, can easily exceed 500 pounds. So you need at least two workers to remove these barrels. In this photo, you can see the barrel is on a red rack um, and that allows forklifts to move the, the barrels around. However, they still have to be rotated manually. Um, so in the background of this photo, you'll notice all these other barrels that will have to be uh, eventually manually rotated. Beer can also be stored in glass bottles. 
Here's an image of a worker grasping two cases of empty bottles, and he's going to put, load them onto the bottling line. Um, one of those cases is about 13 pounds. And note the pinch grip uh, the worker has to grab on the edge of the cardboard box, and he'll have to lift and twist to place the boxes on the line, as well as bending down various um, distances as he has to grab more boxes. Um, uh, beer can also be packaged in cans too, um, but I don't have a photo of that, alas. But crappery workers may also maneuver kegs in coolers. And you can see in this photo, coolers themselves can be cramped spaces where the worker has to lift and sometimes twist to place the full kegs. Here you can see they're um, stacked on top of other often full kegs. And then the worker will have to remove empty or spent kegs. And this presents tripping or being struck by falling objects in these cramped spaces. In the bottom right of this image, you'll see some hoses that are extending from the keg. And these are tap lines or draft lines that deliver the beer from the cooler to the tap in the bar. Uh, this is a very important feature as it's how the beer is extracted from the keg. Now these lines need to be cleaned and use strong caustics. Cleaning these lines can be under pressure and there's a risk of chemical splashes. In fact, in late 2020, the Brewers Association was awarded the Occupational Safety and Health Administration Susan Hayward grant to develop, to develop safety training for proper cleaning of these draft lines. And the first iteration of this training was conducted in February. In addition to manual handling challenges in coolers and warehouses and packaging, workers are exposed to slips, trips, hazards, hot surfaces, and chemicals. This photo here shows a worker cleaning a kegging line and it captures many of these risks. We see hoses, wet floors, and steam or hot surfaces. So we've established that there are inherent risks with craft brewing, but what's the status of the research? Despite the industry growth, there are no published studies um, on injuries among craft brewery workers. There are a few studies that focus on the economic impact, environmental sustainability, and community engagement with craft breweries, but none of these address the workers themselves. So right away, this presented a unique opportunity to contribute. We have this growing industry with workers who are exposed to known hazards and there's no research, which takes me to the first research project or my master's work. So I decided to further investigate the burden of handling kegs. And I performed a field-based ergonomic study where I measured craft brewery workers trunk motion as they handled kegs. Recall kegs can weigh 30 pounds when they're empty and up to 160 pounds when they're full. So I partnered with a medium-sized craft brewery in Fort Collins, Colorado that had a hybrid kegging line workers would manually load kegs onto the line, as we see in this picture, and then they were automatically cleaned, filled with beer, and palletized by a robot. So I focused on the task where the workers manually lift typically empty 30-pound kegs onto the kegging line. I applied a wearable motion capture system, specifically XNs, and in this photo, you can see the orange squares, which are the actual sensors, and you see the blue straps, which are holding other sensors in place. Those sensors are on the worker on the right, and then that generated a 3D kinematic avatar that's been superimposed on the left. I was focused on manual material handling aspect and the risk of low back injuries. But as I conducted this study, I observed craft brewery workers actually spent more of their time doing other tasks than working the keg line. Remember those photos I showed earlier in this presentation about all the other hazardous work they do uh, besides kegging, such as cleaning, packaging, and maintenance. So when I finished my master's research, I decided to keep going and to learn more about occupational injuries among craft brewery workers. So going back to the current state of research, remember there were no published studies on injuries aside from the project I just did. So I looked into injury tracking and reporting. Specifically, I looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics Survey of Occupational Injury and Illnesses. But I learned that national injury surveillance methods do not represent craft breweries. National injury surveillance does not differentiate between large and craft breweries, nor does it even include brew pubs. Large breweries have very different production scales, different levels of automation, and different work hazards compared to craft breweries. So an injury analysis using national injury surveillance data may lead to erroneous perceptions of injuries affecting craft brewery workers. So with no published studies and unreliable national injury surveillance data, how can we understand the state of injuries within the craft brewing industry? Fortunately, workers' compensation data provides a solution. Employers in the United States, including Colorado, are required to provide workers' compensation insurance um, to cover costs associated with injuries workers may sustain on their job. For example, workers' compensation insurance covers medical expenses, disability, and lost wage compensation. 
In Colorado, companies with more than one employee are required to have workers' compensation insurance. In, and then in Colorado, companies can choose where they purchase their workers' comp insurance. Other states that are public, such as Washington, require employers to do workers' comp through a state-run organization. Regardless, the workers' compensation process is as follows. A worker is injured on the job, then they report it to their supervisor, who submits a first report of injury to the workers' compensation insurance provider. And then the insurance company files this claim to cover injury-related costs. Now, researchers can partner with that workers' compensation insurance company to study this injury claims data. And that is exactly what I did. For my dissertation, I partnered with Colorado's largest workers' compensation insurance provider, Pinnacle Assurance, to select claims data specific to craft breweries and brew pubs. So I wanna emphasize the value of this collaboration. I was able to work with Pinnacle and select claims data specifically from their craft brewery and brew pub clients. This workers' compensation injury data allows us to directly investigate injuries that occurred at craft breweries in Colorado. There are no existing injury studies and national injury surveillance data is incomplete regarding craft breweries. So this research represents the first systematic characterization of occupational injuries among craft brewery workers. Pretty cool stuff. So the study had four aims in order to understand and characterize injuries specific to craft brewery workers and identify contributing factors to injury. The first aim was to use workers' compensation claims data from Pinnacle uh, to characterize the distribution and frequency of injuries among craft brewery workers. Pinnacle shared claims data specific to craft breweries that were filed and processed between July 2013 and June 2018. Aim two focused on investigating the costs of these injuries. Aim three investigated the distribution and costs of claims based on whether or not the injured worker was performing manual material handling uh, at the time of injury. And then finally, aim four was a synthesis of the previous aims and injury characteristics to develop a model that illustrated how injuries can occur within the craft brewing industry. So the first report of injury filed to the workers' compensation provider, um, I was able to investigate the distribution and costs associated with both injury characteristics and injured worker characteristics. So for injury characteristics, we knew the injured anatomical region and body part that was affected by the injury. We knew injury nature, what kind of injury occurred. Was it a burn, a laceration, a sprain or strain? And we also knew injury event, what happened that resulted in the injury. Examples of injury events include slip strips and falls, overexertion, and contact with objects or equipment. Injured worker characteristics included how long the worker had been employed at that establishment at the time of injury, which was known as tenure. We also knew the worker's age at the time of injury. And the first report of injury form also included this free response section where the injured worker and or their supervisor could detail what exactly happened during the injury incident. And this was called the accident narrative. So from the accident narrative, I applied the revised agent host environment epidemiologic model to identify and classify contributing factors related to injury. This model illustrates how these contributing factors interact to create the circumstance that resulted in injury. The agent represents the energy. Injuries are a result of a transfer of energy. The host represents the injured worker's activities at the time of injury. The environment represents the physical or social space that the injured worker occupied at the time of injury. And finally, the vehicle represents the physical object that transferred the agent or the energy to the host or the injured worker. So for example, if a worker is handling kegs in a walk-in cooler and drops a keg on their foot, the environment was the walk-in cooler, the host was handling kegs, the vehicle is the keg itself, and the agent is mechanical energy that was transferred from the keg to the worker's foot when it fell. So to create the injury process model, I combined information from the revised agent host environment epidemiologic model with injury characteristics. This injury process model visualized how all the components fit together and resulted in an injury. Elements of the revised agent host environment epidemiologic model are transferred through an injury event to the host's injured anatomical region, and that results in the injury nature. Going back to our previous example of the worker dropping a keg, the keg is coming in contact with the worker's foot as an example of contact with objects and equipment. The foot is part of the lower limb for injured anatomical region and that resulting injury nature was a contusion. So now I wanna share some highlights of the primary findings from this study and their implications. 
So what did the data set look like? During the five-year study period, I identified 570 claims. And this represents 570 injuries that craft brewery workers reported and filed to Pinnacle. 18% of craft breweries who held workers' compensation policies and filed claims were associated with 84% of all claims. This means that the majority of claims in this study came from the same few craft breweries. Within that, the vast majority of the injured workers were male. And the mean age was 32, but it ranged from 18 to 65 years. And then the total amount of lost time reported in this study uh, was 1,297 days, but only 5% of the claims actually reported any lost time. So I investigated the costs of injuries that occurred at craft breweries. This graph here illustrates the distribution of costs per claim. Cost per claim is on the x-axis and it ranged from zero to over $50,000. And the proportion of claims is on the y-axis. We see the majority of claims incurred costs of less than $5,000. In fact, 30% of all claims did not incur any workers' compensation costs or had $0 associated with them. However, in these instances, workers may have used their personal insurance rather than workers' comp to cover associated costs. Now, among those that did incur costs, the median was $680, meaning 50% were associated with costs below that. The mean was higher than the median at $2,100 because of some very high cost claims. And overall costs ranged from $39 to $63,000. So the cost of injuries among craft brewery workers uh, varies substantially. I also investigated injured worker tenure, how long the worker had been employed at that craft brewery at the time of injury. Here's a graph illustrating this distribution. Tenure is represented in years on the x-axis and injury count is on the y-axis. Within the data set, tenure ranged from zero for a worker who had been there for days, weeks, or months to over 30 years. The majority of claims were among workers with less than three years of tenure. In fact, more than 60% of all injured workers had less than two years of tenure at the time of injury. So new workers are experiencing the majority of occupational injuries. I wanna take a moment to highlight one limitation of this approach. Um, tenure, so given the data that I had, um, we only knew how long the worker had been employed at that place at the time of injury. It didn't account um, if they had any previous brewing experience. So that was one interesting limitation. So they could have been injured on their first day, but they'd been working in a separate brewery for years. But we've also established that there are differences between craft breweries, so. I looked into injury nature, and injury nature fell into four main categories in the present study. Sprains and strains and contusions were the most frequently identified injury natures, followed by lacerations and burns. And 15% of claims fell into this other injury nature uh, category collectively called other. While sprains and strains and contusions were the most common, sprains and strains were typically more than twice as expensive as contusions making them the most burdensome financially, both on a per claim and cumulative cost perspective. I also investigated the distribution of claims by injured anatomical region. The majority of claims affected the upper limb, 43%, and lacerations, burns, and contusions were the most frequent injury natures to affect the upper limb. Over 30% of claims affected the trunk region, Sprains and strains and contusions were the most frequent injury natures to affect the trunk region, and the low back was the most frequently injured body part within the trunk region. Finally, the lower limb was associated with 22% of all claims, and contusions were the most commonly observed injury nature to affect the lower limb, and the knee was the most frequently injured body part within the lower limb. By analyzing the accident narratives using the revised age and host environment epidemiologic model, I was able to identify host activity or what the craft brewery worker was doing at the time of injury. These host activities were collapsed into four main activities, carrying or moving items, brewing activities, including packaging, cleaning, and service or food prep. The most common host activity at the time of injury was carrying or moving items at 24%, followed by brewing and packaging at 18%, 
and then food and service uh, prep at 14%, and finally cleaning. While most, um, while service and food prep was not the most common host activity, it's important to emphasize that these activities, which likely occurred at brew pubs, where food and service is a, a major component, um, brew pubs were not represented or captured at all using uh, national injury surveillance methods. But because of this study, we know that craft brew workers do experience injuries while serving beer and preparing food. So now I'd like to talk about the injury process model with a few specific um, injury natures. So this injury process model represents how sprains and strains typically occurred based on the accident narrative and the injury data analysis. We can see from the revised agent host environment model that sprains and strains typically resulted from the worker carrying an item, such as a container or a keg, in the brewing or packaging area. And there was a mechanical transfer of energy due to an overexertion or um, bodily reaction event. Sorry, say that again. We have the revised agent host environment model, the overexertion bodily reaction event, and that transferred typically mechanical energy to the trunk, which resulted in the sprain or strain injury. Some more information on sprains and strains. They accounted for nearly 30% of all the injuries in the present study, so they're the most common. They also incurred the greatest costs, um, both cumulatively at over $350,000, and they had high mean and median costs per claim. Again, the mean is higher than the median because um, there were some very expensive uh, injuries associated with sprains and strains. And then the majority of sprains and strains affected claimants or injured workers with less than two years of tenure at the time of injury. So we're seeing many new hires experiencing these sprains and strains. And then the majority of claimants, uh, over 70%, were between 25 and 44 years old uh, when the injury occurred. I'd like to highlight some key findings related to injury characteristics based on if the worker was performing manual material handling tasks at the time of injury. I determined whether or not the worker was performing manual material handling, essentially moving products, based on the accident narratives. Examples of other tasks or not manual material handling included cleaning, operating equipment, measuring ingredients, and cooking. Overall, fewer injuries occurred while workers performed manual material handling tasks, 29%, compared to those who were injured doing other tasks, 71%. The proportion of contusions between workers was similar between those who performed manual material handling and other tasks. The proportion of sprains and strains among workers performing manual material handling was three times higher than among workers performing other tasks. But then the proportion of lacerations among workers performing other tasks was six times higher than among workers performing manual material handling tasks. So we're seeing more contusions or more, I'm sorry, more sprains and strains among manual material handling and more lacerations and cuts among the other tasks. More than half of the injuries that occurred during manual material handling affected the worker's trunk region, and almost half of the injuries that occurred during other tasks affected the upper limb. However, cost per claim was not significantly different between injuries that occurred during manual material handling or other tasks. And now injuries that occurred during manual material handling incurred more lost days of work, over 800 days, versus injuries that occurred during other tasks, about 480 days, cumulatively. I'd also like to highlight some key findings related to lacerations and burns. Lacerations and burns were both observed to occur in the kitchen area, which makes sense if you think about um, knives and cooking, sharp surfaces and hot surfaces. While lacerations were observed in the packaging area, think broken glass, and burns were more often observed in the brew house, think of metal tanks, or that photo we saw with the, the steam coming off of the equipment. Lacerations were typically a result of mechanical energy, a sharp surface cutting skin, whereas burns were the result of either thermal energy, hot liquids, or chemical energy from caustics and acids. Remember the draft line cleaning process we saw. Now, injured workers were performing maintenance, cleaning, and service or food prep activities at the time both lacerations or burns occurred. Similarly, lacerations and burns uh, equally affected the upper limb. Now, the cumulative cost of lacerations, $67,000, was less than that of burns, but um, 
more laceration injuries occurred in this present study, 19% compared to burns, which accounted for only 10%. So this indicates that burns can be very, very expensive. So next I'll talk about the implications of the study for each specific aim. Recall that aim one focused on the distribution and counts of injury characteristics overall. Now the impact of this is that we can identify what kind of injuries are occurring and where to begin to direct interventions. For example, new workers. The majority of claims affected newer workers with 60% of claims occurring among workers with less than two years of tenure. So updating new hire training or implementing new hire training could um, help improve safety and reduce injuries among these new hires. The upper limb. The majority of claims affected the upper limb. Assessing workplaces for upper limb hazards could um, include implementing equipment modification, such as guards or training or personal protective equipment, such as gloves, um, known as PPE, to reduce the prevalence of these upper limb injuries. For instance, gloves could protect against cuts or um, burns and also provide grip when you're handling the equipment. Sprains and strains. The majority of injuries were classified as sprains and strains. So I would recommend interventions to address sprains and strains through um, equipment modification, training, and again, PPE. So this aim uh, provides critical information on what injuries are actually happening among craft brew workers. It gives us a, a baseline to know what is going on because previously that didn't exist. Which brings me to aim two, considering the cost incurred by these injuries. The impact of this aim is that it quantifies the financial burden of injuries among craft brewery workers. Now injury costs varied a lot in the present study. Many claims had $0 associated with them, which underestimates the true financial burden. Financial cost is a, is a significant factor when considering interventions. The cost of injuries is helpful information for craft breweries budgeting and justifying purchases and upgrades. Sprains and strains. These were the most costly uh, per claim, per claim as well as cumulatively. So interventions that reduce and address this type of injury would likely be very useful. Um, and interventions could be assessing tasks that require lifting and or repetitive motion. We saw lifting and repetitive motion both in the packaging, the cost and cleaning, um, and um, very applicable throughout the craft brewery. Burns. Burns were not a common injury in the present study, but they have the potential to be very costly. Assessing craft breweries to reduce burn hazards is an opportunity for effective intervention. So AIM-2 quantified the financial burden of injuries among craft brewery workers. And again, this financial burden is strictly tied to workers' compensation value. Um, limitations of the study, we weren't able to uh, get the, the personal financial limitation um, or unreported costs, but this gives us something to start with. Aim three combined the first two aims, distribution, what's happening, and the cost of injuries with an additional perspective. This, with this aim, we looked at was the worker performing manual material handling at the time of injury, and how does that change the landscape of injuries? The impact of this aim is that we can better understand what workers are doing at the time of injury and these findings can help target intervention efforts. For example, contusions. Contusions were observed to frequently occur among workers performing both manual material handling and other tasks. So if they're moving equipment or if they're operating equipment and doing cleaning tasks, for example. So interventions to reduce contusions could benefit all craft brewery workers. So thinking about where they come in contact with, with objects to cause those contusions. Injuries that occurred during manual material handling tasks well, injuries that occurred um, during manual material handling were the not the most common, they did account for the most lost time. So from an employee health and craft brewery productivity perspective, it's important to investigate opportunities to reduce or revise manual material handling demands. For instance, um, uh, this is where if you have to manually move kegs or back packages of ingredients, um, how could you automate that or provide lift assist devices to help reduce um, some of those issues. Other tasks. In this present study, more injuries occurred while workers performed other tasks. So it's important for practitioners to not solely focus on manual material handling task areas when developing safety interventions. I ran into this personally when I the, the, the study started with the keg handling um, for my master's work. We noticed that there's 
more, they're doing more things and maybe there's, they're doing more things than keg handling. So we need to take a look at that. And then this second study, looking at workers' compensation data, we actually could quantify that, yes, there are more injuries occurring during these other tasks. So it's, it's important to look into those. So AIM-3 described the frequency and burden of injuries by task, manual material, manual material handling or other among craft brewery workers. And then AIM-4 was where I combined elements of the previous AIMs with the revised agent host environment epidemiologic model and developed that injury process model to investigate where and how the injuries are occurring. So this portion of the, of the research is where I was able to identify relationships between injury characteristics and their details. The portion, um, the impact of characterizing injuries at this level of detail is that it provides information for targeting interventions by workplace, task demands, machinery equipment, and worker activities. For example, sprains and strains. Per, specific, per AIM 1 and 2, I identified that injuries due to sprains and strains were both frequent and costly. From the injury process model, I was able to determine that sprains and strains were associated with host activities of carrying or lifting items and doing repetitive tasks. Therefore, we can recommend that practitioners target work areas with repetitive motion or high lifting demands. The upper limb. All injury natures were observed to affect the upper limb. I identified lacerations, burns, contusions, and sprains and strains all affecting the upper limb. Remember the upper limb can include, or it includes the fingers, the hand, forearm, elbow, upper arm, and to the shoulder. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for injury. I recommend interventions that focus on upper limb protection, such as design modifications and PPE. For instance, design modifications to reduce lifting demands um, and or PPE such as gloves for those lacerations and burns those acute injuries. Packaging, uh, both as a host activity and an environment. So if the host was if the injured worker was doing packaging activities, like we saw that photo of the kegging line or the glass bottles. Um, also as an environment from the accident narratives, we were able to identify if the worker was in the kegging area on the packaging line, um, on the bottling line, canning line. Some narratives just said packaging hall. Um, craft breweries that are large enough can have designated spaces for um, permanent packaging equipment. Smaller craft breweries may have a mobile canning line that they literally wheel into their facility when it's time to do things. So packaging was associated with many injuries and I recommend interventions that assess packaging tasks for repetitive motion, lifting and sharp edges. And again, new hires. From, from AIM-1, I identified that injuries frequently affected new hires. And then with AIM-4 and this injury process model, were able to put it all together and identify that many new hires were performing low technical skill, highly manual and repetitive packaging tasks at the time of injury. Um, part of this research involved subject matter expert interviews where we talked to um, craft brewery workers and industry leaders who again, um, they could confirm some of these uh, relationships we identified from the injury process model. And one of the things they frequently mentioned was that when you have new hires, one of the first things they do is you put them on these low skill jobs because they're new, they don't have that time to accumulate those skills. Um, but then you also see more of those injuries because it's a high risk task. So I recommend craft breweries review and revise their new hire training to specifically address um, safety and packaging. And also uh, I recommend assessing packaging tasks for design modifications to reduce injuries. Uh, one example, we saw that photo of the guy lifting the boxes of glass bottles, is there a way to um, automate that so you don't have that manual handling component or um, have some sort of like pallet jack so he doesn't have to look down as far? Here's some examples. So to continue the implications of AIM-4, burns, we identified that craft brew workers experience different kinds of burns, both chemical and thermal. And so we recommend that practitioners assess both chemical cleaners as well as thermal hazards. Examples of thermal hazards can be uninsulated pipes, um, and if you insulate them, then that can reduce burn hazards. Lacerations occurred when the injured worker's upper limb contacted sharp glass or metal, typically, per the injury process model. So I recommend interventions that address machine guards, training, um, or PPE in the packaging area and the kitchen area to help reduce uh, those cuts from occurring. We also saw injuries occur in the kitchen. Injuries occurred in the kitchen service area 
So if a craft brewery has a restaurant or a kitchen or plans to add one, I would recommend that they implement training and PPE to reduce the risk of burns and lacerations. One interesting component is that at least in Colorado with liquor laws, um, alcohol establishments have to provide some sort of food. So that's why we see a push for restaurants or we'll also see craft breweries partnering with food trucks um, in order to provide that food. But if they have their own restaurant and food prep area, uh, these are some things to consider. So in this research, I used workers' compensation injury data to develop and apply an injury process model to characterize injuries among craft brewery workers in Colorado. This injury process model helps identify who is getting injured, how they're getting injured, and where. Before you can fix a problem, you have to know the scope of the problem. So this model is a tool that health and safety practitioners can use to identify how and where injuries occur in craft breweries. Um, sorry. And uh, this model is a tool you can use to identify. And then with this knowledge, you can um, help develop cost-effective interventions, um, or you can ensure the interventions will be cost-effective because they're sites, you can develop these site-specific solutions. When a worker is injured on the job, that injury can impact their livelihoods and lifestyles. Findings from this study can have lasting effects to reduce injuries and improve the quality of work life among craft brewery workers. So here are those learning objectives revisited again. Uh, we identified common injuries among craft brewery workers using workers' compensation data. And I talked about we, the limitations in reporting injuries, both from the national injury surveillance system limitations, and then uh, we used workers' compensation. And then recognizing the relationships between contributing factors and common injuries among craft brewery workers. And that was part of that injury process model, looking at the injury nature, the um, injured anatomical region and that revised Asian host environment epidemiologic model. Some quick acknowledgements. I'd like to thank all the faculty and staff at Colorado State University during both of my, um, all my graduate studies, as well as um, the people at the Center for Health, Work and Environment. This research would not have been possible without Pinnacle Assurance as they provided the data. And then the craft brewery participation. They, um, the craft brewery industry in Colorado was extremely welcoming and supportive of this research and the Brewers Association um, also helped facilitate um, a lot of the, the involvement in building those relationships. So thank you. And if you have any questions, you can find me at LinkedIn um, and, uh, and through this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brents. That was fantastic. Um, very in-depth in and well-detailed analysis. Um, we do have some good questions rolling in for you. So I'm glad we have some time left over for that. Um, I think I'll kick it off with one of my own. Can you talk a little bit about how your XNs data um, factored into your, to the, to the, to your research? Yeah, so the XNs um, technology, it allowed us to do a study in an operational craft brewery during working hours. Um, so we didn't have to try to recreate a keg handling task in a lab. We were able to and um, bring in workers. We were able to uh, study the people, do this day in day out, um, and the uh, so yes, yeah, so we were able to do the study in the field with this wearable motion capture system. Due to the the nature of the sensors, it was pretty easy to put on and take on put on the workers and take it off at the end, um, and then. The, the XN system, it generated that avatar that we saw that included a biomechanical model that exported some joint information. And so for that project, I was interested in the low back angles. So that came from that, um, that their algorithm and we were able to look at that. Now, um, the craft breweries are typically small, which means there's maybe only a few people that operate the keg line. And this was a medium sized craft brewery. In fact, the brewery where this research was done is um, one of the larger craft breweries in Colorado, and they only had five people working the kegging line. Um, so I was able to measure all five workers. Um, and then the production schedule varies. So they're not kegging all the time. And they might do, depending on the beer, they might do a larger keg run or they might do a smaller keg run. So uh, as we collected data for that, we learned this. There's not many people doing kegging because there's not a strong demand for it sometimes. Um, and that's when we started talking to those workers. It's like, so when you're not doing the kegging line, what are you doing? Like, oh, well, I work in the 
the, um, the, the, the brewing, uh, the brewing area and the, the cellar moving hoses around and um, on the other packaging lines. Oh, another thing that was interesting while we were gathering the sexons data is that they would load the kegs on and then the kegs would start to go through the machine. And then um, as that's going, they would have to go check tank pressure across the, um, across the wet. So then we could pause and then they would run across and then you could see them ducking under tanks and um, navigating these potentially hazardous environments. So that was another thing we noticed. Um, one benefit of that XNs approach is that the sensors are all contained. So uh, they, you can uh, study them as they go about the brewery. Um, other motion capture technology requires an external camera system. So imagine having to go into a brewery and set up a camera system and gauge where is the worker going to be. Uh, with the self-contained system or self-contained sensors, um, you didn't have to do that, you could just they could just go anywhere in the brewery. Um, yeah, that's yeah. Some okay, point. great. Let's that's thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, let's uh, uh, more and more questions keep flowing in, so I want to <laughs> I want to jump into these right away. Um, I think I'll just hit, uh, tackle some of these in the order that I received them. Uh, can you uh, what, what footwear is worn in the brewery commonly? Mm. Um, so it, a craft brewery is a production facility. Um, so you should wear closed toe shoes, oftentimes the comp, um, composite or steel toe boots. Um, and uh, yeah, you, in case there's splashes of, um, sometimes if they're dealing with hot wort, you could have hot solutions splash on, there's chemicals, you want closed toe shoes um, and then even work boots. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people okay. forget it's a production facility. There's forklifts moving around, there's, there's stuff. Absolutely. And you found that most that that seemed to be what was you observed pretty much in your experience in the field. You're seeing pretty sensible footwear being used or. Yeah. Yeah. I came in at a time when safety was becoming um, more and more on the forefront of these craft breweries. Um, there was an OSHA emphasis program recently implemented. So safety was important, was prioritized. OK, here's another one for you. For breweries that mill their own grain, has, it been any, has there been any guidance on controlling the amount of combustible dust in craft breweries? And also, do larger production facilities, Budweiser, Coors, and so forth, follow um, combustible dust guidance? So I focused on injuries and musculoskeletal disorders, but I remember picking up some of this combustible dust um, information. So um, craft breweries, or just breweries in general, I remember in the grain site, in the grain milling area, they had um, like plastic cut or like flat covers over hoses and pipes so you don't get dust collecting so you can blow it off um, or clean it off easier. And, um, and then, yeah, there was uh, increased attention on ventilation in that area so you don't get that dust build up. Um, for the larger craft breweries, often that grain milling can be done automatically so you reduce the amount of times people have to go in there. Um, the Brewers Association has a series of online trainings too that um, address specific hazards and they have one on uh, combustible dust in the milling area. And it's free for anybody to access. Excellent. Um, given the amount of manual material handing, handling, uh, lifting and moving you observed, um, what kind of mechanical assist, lift assist devices did you encounter? Um, so it depends. We, there's manual material handling in the craft brewery itself and um, maybe outside. So one uh, lift assist device I saw in the brewery is a vacuum lift assist. So instead of when you're lifting the kegs, um, there's like a suction that you would attach to the keg and then that would remove the, um, the physical weight that you have to, and you just have to navigate it. Now limitation of a vacuum lift is that it has to be in one area where you're going to be lifting kegs all the time. Um, if you're in a warehouse where you're moving kegs all over the place, one of those stationary lift assist devices doesn't make sense. Um, I also saw keg dollies. So these are um, either dollies or attachments to dollies that um, can attach onto the keg themselves to help hold them in place. There's also um, pallet jacks to, so you don't have to push the kegs around. You can have a little bit of an assist or forklifts. There's forklift attachments for handling kegs. Um, and then there's uh, um, dollies, or like electric dollies. Um, that can help so you don't have to pull as much. Those are do examples you, of some. Do you think there are, are there any obvious omissions in that space right now? I mean, given the injury data, uh, or do, you, do you sort of see anything like, oh, well, they should be using one of these or someone should develop this intervention 
Um, is there anything glaring like that in the craft brewing industry? Um, can you repeat? Or to yeah, sorry. So, yeah. I mean, given given the injuries that you observed in the data, um, and what and the interventions you just described, um, for example, the keg dolly, mm -hmm. do you think of any? Um, did it occur to you in the space when you're there um, that there are some glaring omissions with respect to um, physical interventions or devices that they could be using or should be using that you are able to counsel them on and say, hey, you know, you could really <laughs> impact your injury rates if you use this particular device. Nothing like um, that? So it really depends on the, the place and their resources, uh, the manpower or the people power, how many workers there are. Um, team lifts obviously are um, a less expensive, are going to be less expensive than fancy lift devices, you still have that manual component, but then the multiple workers reduces the overall um, effort per person. But then what are your staffing demands? Can you have people on hand? Um, oftentimes breweries can be hectic and people are running around checking tank pressures. So if you need somebody to help do this lift, is that gonna be taking them away from this other thing? So that comes back to building a culture that um, prioritizes and um, supports and encourages safe behavior. Um, yeah, so one, thing that I would want to emphasize and that I saw the, um, the people I worked with in the craft breweries really value was yeah, creating this culture around craft brewing where yes, we have to move these kegs. Yes, we have to move that tonight, but it's okay to you go get that dolly. It's okay to go find somebody to help with the team lift. Don't just power through it. Um, really building a culture is going to be, um, have a significant help to this kind of thing. Another um, quick, uh, What's the, what's the word I want? Not a quick fix, but an easy fix that you could see on the spot is how the, the workspace is laid out. One of my first projects in a craft brewery was in their hops room and like the, the, the chiller where they stored all the hops. And you see the workers bending down to grab buckets of hops to build the different recipes. And they're having to duck under shelves. They're having to navigate around other tanks. And it's like, what if we just take a step back and think about where this stuff is stored. And like they had a table that they had to go across the brewery to go get and then bring it here, just have its own table there. Thinking about how people move in the workspace and what you can do to um, increase efficiency in there. That's another uh, avenue you could take. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question for you. Is there a lot of turnover in workers given the number of injured are higher with, number of injuries are higher with newer workers? Ah, um, that is a great question. Yeah. So. Um, you get that uh, um, element in, in research. So I had more injuries among the newer workers compared to the workers with older tenure. Is that because the workers, if that when that first few years of tenure kind of weeds out people, so you're more likely to see injuries and the high turnover there versus the people that just stick it out or the people that last there longer because they're being safer or they've just been lucky. Um, that, that limitation aside, um, there is still that issue of you have more of the, um, the, the manual intensive tasks um, with that lower skill with those newer workers. Um, so I forget the initial wording on that question, but you would see a higher turnover with those more manual tasks just because that's where A, you have more people um, and B, that's where you might have fewer resources. Um, okay, start great. With. I, I'm, let's, I'll just, let's jump through a couple more here before we run out of time. I can talk so much about this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and that's great. And we have, we're not going to get through all of these questions, um, unfortunately. And uh, in fairness, I think if, uh, if you, if I can give out your email at the end of this, we could do that, or people can send questions to us and we can relay them to you. I don't know, however you, however you'd like to do that, but we'll, let's just, March through some more here. Um, someone wants to know if you used the uh, workers comp class code 2021 to generate your statistics. Um, sorry, the workers comp code. Uh, WC class code 2021. I'm not familiar with it. I assume WC means workers comp code. But I um, know. If they're talking about, uh, was it industry classification codes? Does that WCCI? Um, we I originally thought about using the industry classification codes, but um, under current systems that combines large and craft breweries together, do they're just beverage manufacturing or fermentation, fer fermented beverage and, um, and then breweries. 
and through pubs where um, you have that restaurant component, uh, they're actually classified as restaurants. So using that industry classification code would have restricted us. So that's why we just went with, um, or partnered with Pinnacle and they um, found, identified their craft breweries and brew pubs um, from their client list and then gave us the um, uh, de-identified information. Thank you. Did your study determine um, the percentage or number of craft breweries that sought assistance from safety, consultation, ergonomic services, it's like OSHA on-site consultation program, for example? And if so, was that data contrasted with uh, breweries that do not have uh, outside safety assistance? Um, so the question, so asking about uh, was there a variable in the study? Do these breweries actively seek safety and health assistance? I, that I was not a variable mm -hmm. in the study, but I think that's a very interesting perspective to include. Um, one note I would like to make is that a lot of times workers' compensation insurance will have resources that include some of that safety guidance and safety guidelines. Um, so already maybe workers, maybe the companies did utilize these services. Um, that was not a variable I had, but that would be really interesting to study and identify because I do know the craft breweries do actively use the resources from the Brewers Association and OSHA consultation. Um, I just don't know if that's been quantified. Excellent. Yeah, that was um, sort of relates to another question I got over in the chat section, which was, uh, does the brewing industry have an overarching regulatory body to which this valuable research has been shared with whom this I suppose to be to better understand the injury burden, but also how to spread awareness and provide resources of support, particularly to smaller breweries. Yeah, so there's um, there are some industry guideline organizations such as the Brewers Association, there's also the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, and then there'll be um, state brewers guilds, for instance, the Colorado Brewers Guild. And I, um, I was involved uh, with all those organizations and they were very helpful and supportive. And um, yes, this research has been shared with them and I hope to continue that relationship. That's great. I. Um... I'm trying to find one here that was related to, well, I've got so many, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm getting a little bit overwhelmed here. Um, oh, sorry, I can't find it right now. It's a fantastic uh, question. Oh, I um, threw my uh, email in the chat also. If people oh, great. Questions. Thank you. So uh, you, you guys um, should see um, Dr. Brent's email in the in the chat. So if I don't get your question, I apologize and please feel free to pass it along. Um, let's see, some quick ones. Do thermal burns include boil overs? Yes, mm -hmm. that quick makes answer. Sense. Good, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, did the workers handling kegs wear impact resistant footwear, safety shoes? Do you know if metal, if, if uh, safety toes are involved in that? Um, I would want to review the craft breweries individual safety policies. Um, when I did the study in the kegging area, they were wearing closed toe shoes, although um, we did not specifically ask if they were composite or steel toe. Gotcha. But that is something to um, follow up on because hopefully it was. Um, were there any concerns regarding confined space entry hazards? Was that something you saw in the job site? Um, I did see that, yeah, with uh, tanks, the fermentation tanks. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's like access portals and could they have like a mirror on a stick to look in there first before they just stick their heads in there. Um, confined space is a challenge in craft breweries. Excellent. And uh, carbon dioxide, is that a hazard? It can be both from um, the fermentation side and uh, the packaging side. When they do cans and bottles, they add a little bit extra CO2 in there. Um, and there is some current research going on on CO2 levels um, at CSU. That was not. Great. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Does does an OSHA ten hour general industry training certificate with an emphasis on brewery safety exist in Colorado? I love that I question. I do not know. I would reach out to the Brewers Association because if it doesn't exist, that might be something that they'd be interested in including in the future. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of people. Um, thanking you for an excellent presentation. Uh, just, oh, thank you. Uh, wanted to make sure I didn't pass over that. Um, 
I am still, okay, I found what I was looking for. Um, this is from Nicole. I'll mention your name, Nicole, since you've, um, you, I think I, you wanna, this is plugging your presentation a little bit. Um, says, great presentation. I recently completed a national study on this same information. I'll be presenting this info at the Craft Brewers Conference in Denver in September. Ooh. I did not use workman's comp though. So it's, this information is great to add to the conversation and I completely agree. So that's fantastic. Nice. Send me a message, Nicole. I wanna, I wanna hear more about your research. There you go, Nicole. See the chat in the email, calling.brents at gmail.com. You can reach Dr. Brents. Um, I apologize to any of you um, whose questions left are left lingering. Um, there were plenty of them and a lot of great ones. So um, I, I thank you for that, but we do have to uh, pack up the tent here. Um, you can learn more and register for our upcoming events at coeh.berkeley.edu. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel, as I mentioned. And if you did log in with your registration email today, you'll receive a link to the evaluation form that'll qualify you for a certificate of completion worth one CE hour, contact hour, if you have any questions for us here at COEH Northern California, you can drop us a line at coehce at berkeley.edu. That's coehce at berkeley.edu. Thank you so much, Dr. Brents. Fantastic presentation. And thanks everyone for joining us today. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>